And if you think I'm a dismal scientist, I want to now introduce our next speaker. Conal McQuilla can do depression like nobody can do depression. <laughs> uh, but the, he has the great, great uh, ring of authenticity insofar as for two decades uh, that I've known him uh, uh, in Davies, he has been one of the most authoritative uh, and credible economists in this country. And therefore, to set the macroeconomic scene of where we're at in uh, Q1 2023, please give a warm welcome to Conal McQuilla. Thanks, Ivan. That's quite an introduction. Hard to follow that up. Um, as I was just coming in here, um, the security guard of the way, and there's some young, trendy people going to the social media event. And he sort of waved them to the, the right, and then he looked at me and he said, oh, your pensions. <laughs> so, uh, you know you're getting older. <laughs> I um, don't know what that says about me and the audience. Um, so look, um, I'd like to be really cautiously optimistic uh, today, if I might be. hope that won't upset Ivan uh, in terms of the outlook, or a little, at least a little less pessimistic. Uh, and it's also been an extremely difficult year at Davey uh, in terms of managing money. Uh, and um, we we're actually doing a market outlook events this week. And um, I think cautiously optimistic is, you know, hopefully where we'd be given uh, the very difficult, difficult year we've had. So... These, um, this chart shows the, the forecasts from consensus for the US, Europe, the UK, etc. And really, the market, I think, was kind of baking in the worst of all worlds. Uh, you know, a recession in the United States about to start, pretty much at the start of 2023. The UK and Europe already in recession. Inflation to remain quite high and persistent. Uh, and as well as that, uh, central banks expected to kind of really be extremely tough. And so, as, as I'm sure you know, over the past couple of weeks, markets have done a little bit better. And we've seen some positive signs that, first of all, if you look at Europe and the UK, they might just about steer clear of recession, despite the, we've, despite the fact of Ukraine and uh, the real income squeeze that we've seen. So, for example, look at European industrial production. actually hasn't um, contracted at all, even though the PMI surveys have been extremely weak. Uh, the UK might just see around flat growth in Q4. Uh, the United States has been kind of more resilient than anyone would have expected, or certainly more resilient uh, than some of the economists had predicted. Uh, so will we get a recession there? There's certainly a slowdown, but hard to say we'll have a recession or not. So again, just the economy's been a bit more resilient uh, than expected. Uh, so you know, hopefully we'll see a little bit of growth. And I think you know you would have seen the Financial Times last week say, for example, that the International Monetary Fund is planning uh, to actually raise its um, uh, forecast potentially at the end of January. So inflation coming down. You know, we've seen the peak in inflation. Some more positive signs that maybe. Uh, this year will be a little bit better than uh, some of the pretty dire forecasts at the beginning of the year. If you look at that table carefully, you would have seen the UK was uh, very much the outlier. Uh, growth in the UK expected to be the weakest amongst the G7 and the strongest uh, uh, rate of inflation. I think when we look at the UK, you know, when you stand back from the kind of drama around Boris Johnson's premiership and the mini-budget, or not so mini-budget, in the autumn, uh, really, it's Brexit that's hurting the UK. Uh, it's hurting export performance. Exports in the UK performed very poorly since they left uh, the EU single market in 2021. As well as that, the UK has cut itself out of EU supply chains. Uh, the labour market is less flexible now, so they have a real pernicious inflation problem. Uh, so you're seeing wage growth uh, considerably higher in the UK than in other countries, and obviously the Bank of England uh, responding to that. Um, I worked in London for um, eight years. I had a great time in my 20s. Um, and um, I sort of had friends of mine sort of call me up and say, what on earth are we going to do when we have to refinance our mortgage? So you can see here in the chart, uh, with the mini budget and with expectations at that time, the Bank of England might have to raise rates to 6%. Mortgage rates in the UK got to 6.5%. Uh, you know, absolutely extraordinary. Now, to come back a little bit, on average, they're kind of 5.6, 5.7. You might be just about able to get some products below 5%, but this is an enormous change for you know, a population that was used to interest rates around 1% to 2% on their mortgages. So if you're refinancing, as many will be, over the next well, 2 million households over the next 12 months, you're going for an interest rate of 1% to 2% to over 5%. That's an enormous hit to your real incomes. And the Bank of England itself has estimated that there could be as many as 700,000 households in the UK where 70% of their after-tax income as they refinance will go on the mortgage after accounting for food and energy costs. So, you know, a very difficult... Uh, stress position for many UK households, you know, cut hit. You know, those are the kind of people you think would struggle to pay their mortgage potentially. Uh, so, um, you know, a very difficult situation and really 
this housing market dynamic has kind of added to the difficulties of Brexit, and we can all thank Liz Truss and Quasi Quartang for that uh, to a large extent. Um, you know, if you look at the UK housing market at the moment, you know, interest rates with stretched valuations, interest rates of 5 6% just don't work. So house prices are falling in the UK now. People expecting kind of double digit declines over the first part of, um, you know, well, they've already fallen by 4% as it is, but maybe that peak to trough fall will be kind of 10, 12% eventually. So, but on a slightly brighter note, um, just here's some of the, um, I suppose, good news um, just over the past couple of weeks and months. First of all, if we were to be really critical of ourselves and Dave in terms of the outlook for equity markets and the economy more generally, uh, what we didn't see was the Ukraine war and in particular the big surge in natural gas prices. So you know, Nord Stream 1 was shut down during the summer uh, fully by around October and we saw natural gas prices in Europe surge to 350 euro per megawatt hour and stay well above 200 euro for most of the year. Uh, early this year, they've been trading around 60 euro per megawatt hour, so kind of back towards levels that would have been there just before the war in Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, this reflects the mild winter, but also the fact that European governments have been pretty successful in terms of um, building up storage, uh, LNG imports, and the likes of Qatar, the United States. Uh, so you can see the curve there. It doesn't really pick up that much next summer. I think what we'll probably see over the next couple of months is kind of a standoff between European governments and um, energy companies who will, in some respect, have locked in far higher energy costs and may be reluctant to pass these uh, lower wholesale costs through to consumers. But as the pressure comes on, and if they do start to pass on these lower energy costs uh, to consumers, inflation is likely to fall back uh, perhaps more aggressively than many people are expecting. If you look at the Spanish um, CPI inflation rate, and that's a slightly special case uh, because of the way the energy market is um, regulated, their inflation rate's already down towards 5%. Uh, so I think over the next couple of months, you'll certainly see the energy contribution to inflation fall away uh, if prices are actually cut in terms of um, what retailers are facing. And, you know, depending on how quickly that happens, uh, you will, you know, could see much more downward pressure on headline inflation rates than maybe people are expecting at the moment. I have the dubious honour of having to do my new economic forecast for Ireland in the next week or two. And, you know, the real judgment for me, and I'm going to be wrong, I'll make an assumption, uh, but, you know, if this is passed through to um, you know, consumer prices. You know, the average household bill in Ireland has gone from around 2,000 euro to 4,000 euro. If that's reversed, you, know, you could get a really much faster downward pressure on inflation. That's obviously good news to the consumer. Uh, and it's kind of the big uncertainty at the moment. You know, can the, these low prices be sustained and how fast they'll get passed on? The other point is um, wage pressures, um, to a large extent, weren't really the, the dog that didn't bark. In some countries like Germany, yes. You do see some wage pressure, but in aggregate in Europe, you know, wages haven't picked up anywhere near as aggressively as the United States or the United Kingdom. Uh, so there's been a little bit of good news there, signs the US labor market is loosening a little bit. Um, you know, what really kind of, I suppose, freaked out central bankers last year were these surveys saying that people expected inflation to be sustained. And you're starting to see that in terms of wage negotiations and uh, pressure on wages. That's happened a little bit in Europe. Some of the recent data is a little bit better. Again, the United States, average hourly earnings is starting to decelerate. Um, and then, look, you know, the UK, um, the one country which, um, you know, really stands out as having extremely strong wage growth. Brexit clearly an impact there, less migration into the UK, a more rigid labour market. Uh, but hopefully, if we can see more of this, it might give central banks a little bit more room for manoeuvre on rates as um, the year progresses. On the central banks themselves, I mean, look, we are going to see more rate hikes in the next couple of weeks and months, which, you know, aren't um, particularly welcome. Having said that, I think markets understand that, you know, everything the central banks, under, the literature central banks are looking at, it sort of says, if you see an inflation problem, get in there early, talk tough, bring inflation and expectations back down again. So, you know, the Fed is telling us they're going to raise rates to, you know, over 5%. Uh, the Bank of England expected to peak around 4.5%. Um, the ECB, our own governor, Gabriel McLoof, was out telling us that we're going to have two 50-bit hikes up to 3% in the coming months. Didn't tell us what he thought was going to happen to inflation, I noticed. Um, uh, but and I suppose that's the issue which you know, we discussed there. Maybe there's been some positive news. But again, if you look at these curves here, you see them shifting up over time. But you know, markets are beginning to put in rate cuts uh, towards the end of this year. So you know, either thinking, you know, Central bankers may get to these high levels, but you know ultimately inflation will start to come down. You know the economies can't really take these kind of level of rates, 
And if they do get up to those levels, it'll be for only a short, a temporary period of time, and eventually they'll have to come down again. I think if we start to see inflation come down a little bit more aggressively in the next couple of months, hopefully we will. Uh, as long as central banks, bankers see that, uh, maybe their, their tune will change a little bit uh, on, on rates. Maybe we might not even get to 3.5% as uh, some people have commented in terms of, you can see in the curve here for the ECB, maybe we'll fall short a little bit of that despite some of the tough talk you've heard over the past week or two. In terms of equity markets, absolutely terrible year last year. Um, and I suppose, uh, I suppose our job in Davies is going to handhold to some extent, reassure people they should be investing over the long term. So what we did in this chart is look at uh, various past episodes where equity markets had fallen by 25%. So, you know, a very sharp uh, correction. And the good news, as you can see in the sort of the green parts of this table, is that in the years after this kind of correction, equity markets typically tend to do pretty well. So again, this is perhaps an opportunity. Now, it doesn't happen in every occasion, and if you're to look at um, the occasions where it hasn't happened, the 1970s obviously, obviously sticks out with a kind of sustained stagflation. Interest rates kept on going up. Um, maybe the period around 2000 where you know valuations in the tech sector got extremely stretched. Uh, and... Um, you know, those are two sort of exceptions. And, you know, I would like to believe we're not in those kind of, you know, stagflation may go away, you know, concern may go away quicker than expected. And we have already seen quite a big correction in valuations, which you can see here. So you look at these valuations, particularly for Europe, um, you know, there has been quite a big correction. It doesn't look that expensive. Uh, the same for the UK, although I think when you look at the UK stock market, uh, Brexit is a concern there and people are not maybe investing because of that. Uh, the United States not quite as clear cut, but there does seem to be quite a big correction in European valuations. And to some extent, people are speculating we may begin to see US investors move back into European markets, having ignored them for quite some time. So again, if you look at these kind of valuation charts, it says, well, maybe there's less uh, room for concern. These are prices uh, to forward earnings. And of course, people need to see those forward earnings We're in the middle of results season at the moment. So as long as that doesn't go too badly, um, you know, I think people have a little bit more, a little bit more faith that uh, you know we have seen quite a big correction and um, there's room for um, to invest here. Around um, said that, you know, again, you do need to be cognizant that the dollar is extremely strong at the moment. We used one of these fundamental equilibrium exchange rate estimates. You can use the five-year average is almost equally as good in terms of trying to predict the exchange rate. But you know, at current levels, the dollar does look um, you know overvalued versus the euro. You know, 117 would have been kind of, I suppose, the traditional estimate of, you know, where the equilibrium lies. Uh, but again, you can invest in U.S. equities hedged for currency movements. Uh, so, you know, if you're concerned about that, um, you know, there is ways to hedge yourself. But again, this is something we're kind of taking on board in terms of portfolio construction and uh, that we, you know, we do, we could be hurt quite badly if the dollar were to lose value um, over the next um, 12, 24 months. On to Ireland. Um, you know, the first thing to say is the economy is performing well beyond what anyone would have expected. Absolutely unbelievable performance over the past couple of years. The level of employment in Ireland is already 9% above its pre-pandemic level. That's pretty unheard of. Uh, you know, we've seen the GDP growth rates. Of course, there's a kind of a healthy debate about whether those GDP growth rates are representative, but, you know, it's not a statistical mirage. The multinational sector is clearly doing well. There's a lot of foreign direct investment into the economy. Uh, the indigenous sector is a kind of just about just over pre-pandemic levels, similar to the kind of rebound you're seeing in other countries. Of course, consumers are under pressure. We think we'll see a pretty subdued consumer spending in the coming quarters and then maybe a rebound in the second half of the year. And then that brings us back to inflation and all those issues. But, I mean, to have the labour market performing as strong as it is, is, you know, great. Uh, the public finances are in surplus. You know, that's extremely rare. Uh, you know, only one or two countries in the OECD have managed that. Um, so it's giving the government a lot of room for flexibility, and you know I suspect we'll see more supports for incomes uh, if oil, oil, if energy prices stay pr at a high level uh, for some time. So look, it is a good, very good story, uh, but of course brings us own problems. Just the last couple of weeks and months, um, I've had a lot of queries on the tech sector. Um, you know, when people hear about job cuts on Facebook and Google and so on and so forth, uh, it does kind of make them worry that the sort of the model is broken. Um, I don't think that's the case. On this chart here, we're showing you where the um, 300,000 workers in the multinational sector reside. So let's bear in mind that over half of the jobs growth and over half of the employment in the multinational sector is not in the tech sector. It's in, pharma, it's in pharmaceuticals, medtech, 
uh, business and financial services. And those sectors continue to grow very sharply last year. Uh, the IDA, which I think on balance is, doesn't want to overpromise and underdeliver, deliver uh, said it had co quite a good flow of investment in, for the first um, half of 2023, had a very strong year in 2022, stronger even than 2019, and that's despite the very challenging economic conditions that we saw last year. So again, I don't think, I think there's no end almost to the medtech and pharma side. It seems to be extremely strong. We we'll certainly see a slowdown in the ICT sector, but when I've kind of looked at the job cuts that have been announced over the past couple of weeks, maybe 2,000, 3,000 jobs at most so far, uh, to make what Google finally decide on. You know, there's 9,000 uh, technology jobs added in 2022. Uh, so what you see, you look at, the, at these sort of household names, is that there's a very, a very aggressive hiring surge in recent years. They're beginning to pare that back a little bit. But in most cases, uh, these companies are only bringing employ their employment back to where it was at the end of 2021 or even early 2022. So... You know, I think in five years' time, the tech sector will still be with us. It's going through a particular period of adjustment. There's winners and losers. TikTok, for example, is still expanding their employment. So I don't think it's over by any means, but um, maybe to some extent it won't provide quite the same growth in exports and jobs that we saw in the past couple of years. Just on the public finances, you know, running a surplus, 5 billion, 1% of GDP, uh, very rare, great place to be. Uh, but of course, as you know, the Department of Finance is increasingly concerned about the fact that 10 companies account for 50% of corporation tax revenues. Uh, if anything were to happen to one of those companies, we might suddenly see a hole develop. You can see you know, 15 billion corporation tax revenue, revenues in 2021, uh, growing to 23 billion in 2022. I think what's really going on here beneath the surface is not just the profitability of the companies being good, but this, uh, the deadline in 2020 in terms of bringing intangible property assets from places like Bermuda and the Cayman Islands into Ireland, we saw that. Or that's be brought close to the substance or onto onshore, into onshore locations. And that massive import of intellectual pro property products is still pushing up corporation tax revenue. So although we're kind of worried about how reliant we are on corporation tax, we'll probably be here at the end of 2023. And again, corporation tax revenues have beaten uh, the, uh, you know, the official forecasts. So, I mean, it's not an easy place to be, but it, st it still seems quite buoyant at the moment. Just uh, my last slide in the housing market in Ireland. I mean, you look across the globe, people are expecting 10 to 20% declines. Canada and Sweden seem to be the two countries that have had the most um, aggressive bubble. Uh, you know, and that's unwinding. People are expecting 20% falls there, you know, 10 to 15% expected in, say, the US, the UK. What about Ireland? I think we're certainly seeing a slowdown. Um, prices have probably been more resilient in the fourth quarter than anyone would have expected. They're still going up. Uh, in Dublin, they have fallen for two months in a row. Uh, and, of course, valuations became more stretched in Dublin. But we had forecast 4% house price inflation through 2023. Um, now, then, we had a big surprise from the central bank. They decided they were going to loosen the mortgage lending rules so the three-and-a-half times threshold on first-time buyer loan to income multiples is gone. So you can go to the bank now, and the threshold is four times. So with the housing market as it is, and you know so much competition for homes... Uh, you know, employment certainly hasn't uh, fallen away. Uh, I mean, first-time buyers are quite likely to be going into the bank now and looking for higher levels of mortgage debt, which could drive prices higher still. Uh, the central bank itself has estimated the rule change could eventually add 8% to house prices over and above your existing forecast. Uh, they thought that might happen over three years. Perhaps it might happen over one. Uh, so our forecast for 4% inflation... We'll be watching the mortgage lending data very closely to see how much debt first-time buyers are taking on. If we see that ramping up, up aggressively early in the year, maybe our forecast for 4% inflation this year is even too um, uh, conservative. So, I mean, certainly very surprised to see the central bank uh, decide now is the right time to allow people to borrow more. Uh, we've certainly got a lot of inflation as it is, but um, that's what they've done. Uh, just on the housing market, in terms of the government's response, um, <clears throat> you see in the chart here the official housing for all targets. Extremely ambitious. Here, you can see they're building around five to 6,000 social houses each year over the past couple of years. Uh, Darabrian's official target is for 9,000 in 2022, another 4,000 cost rental on top. Uh, I suspect the outturn will be maybe seven to eight at most. Uh, so you know, I'm sure you're aware of the political debate where... You know, the government has allocated around $2 billion per annum for social housing. Sinn Féin might say, let's double that. Uh, I mean, I think we're doing well just to spend the $2 billion that's already allocated. 
because of the kind of rigidities and the problems in the approved housing body sector and with, amongst local authorities, the inertia or constraints they face. Um, I mean, they clearly have struggled year in, year out. We've actually put around €2 billion Euro in the budget uh, for the last three, four years to achieve 10,000 social houses per annum. And as you can see here, in each of those years, we've fallen short. So it's kind of a pity that we haven't had a much more mature debate about the capacity of local authorities and approved housing bodies to actually deliver this 10,000 social housing target and cost rental on top. Again, if you look at the two listed home builders, Karen and Glenvey would hope to build, you know, are building 1,500 houses each, would hope to eventually get to 3,000. We're asking our local authorities and approved housing bodies to do something much more ambitious. I'm not sure they're really in a, a suitable state uh, to deliver that kind of ambition. But look, I think in fairness to Dara Breen, you know, I think the fact he put in these very aggressive targets and the funding is to kind of provide a little bit of political pressure and ramp up uh, the pressure on local authorities to actually go and deliver uh, social housing. So look, I'll stop there. Thank you for listening this morning. You've probably gone slightly um, over time. I'm not sure if we've got time for question and answers now, but um, I'll be around afterwards at tea if, if anyone's a question then. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Connell. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much.